and welcome to the Skillful Podcast, where we explore DBT and RODBT skills to help you reduce emotional suffering, improve your relationships, and become more present in your life. I'm your host, Mariel Berg, a psychotherapist at the Bay Area DBT and Couples Counseling Center. So welcome back, Ed. I'm really excited to begin talking with you today about distress tolerance. Yes, I think this is really helpful, helpful stuff when it comes to managing emotions. Yes. And when we get to this module in our skills group, it seems like this is the module. This is the reason why a lot of people sign up for DBT skills group in the first place. Right. And for me, the distress tolerance is like how we get a basic grip on what to do when emotions are overwhelming. So much of what the rest of the skills teach us how we can guide our emotions, but distress tolerance is the baseline of like, oh, what do we do if I'm feeling overwhelmed? Yeah. And not having enough skills or tools in our toolbox creates a lot of problems, which we'll, we'll go into in a moment, and which is why I think people wind up in skills group because they're wanting and needing ways or more effective ways to get through those really emotionally rough times. Absolutely. So we teach a whole set of skills in this module, which are all about how to tolerate emotional upset, the rough stuff in life, because this is part of life. No one escapes pain in life and hard times. Absolutely. And I think for me, one of the things I'm aware of is that having practiced distress tolerance skills for a while now, I still get in situations where I'm like, oh my God, (laughs) this is overwhelming. So it's like, even if we're really practicing stuff, life is life and we still have crises that come up. Yes. And We can be masters, I think, at the distress tolerance skills, and it doesn't mean that overwhelming things aren't going to happen. People we love will die, we will get sick, things will not go our way, and we need to learn how to ride out those emotional storms in the most graceful way that we can without creating additional problems for ourselves. Absolutely. And I also think about when I reflect on distress tolerance that for many of us, myself included, we can fall into this trap of thinking that we can escape pain or distress, or if we're experiencing emotional pain, then somehow we're doing it wrong. This idea like this shouldn't be happening or this shouldn't be happening to me. Right. And I think one of the basic skills is being able to just acknowledge, like I am having a lot of stress right now. I am overwhelmed because that's where we can choose what we do instead of feeling like we need to just make it go away as quickly as possible. And that's where a lot of times we can get into trouble because we do short-term things to make the pain go away that then cause longer-term problems for us. Right, exactly. And that's the whole crux of what we're talking about. And that's how we get to assess whether these skills are working. Have you survived the storm, your emotional storm, without creating additional problems for yourself? If you have, then great. Then your distress tolerance skills are working. If you feel better, wonderful. That's a bonus, but that isn't necessarily the point of these skills. Absolutely. And just to backtrack a little bit, because I wanted to expand some on this idea of resistance of emotional pain, this idea of like, this shouldn't be happening or there's something wrong with me if something bad is happening in life. I think that that creates an additional level of suffering for people. And so we won't go into it today, but we will in a a few weeks. This leads us into reality acceptance skills, specifically the skill of radical acceptance, which is one of the most powerful in DBT. And I think that learning to sit with distress and maybe even make meaning of it is something that can be missed in the therapy world. Often we're focused on making things better or on change. I think that when we are in distress ourselves, we want it to go away. We do not want to feel intense pain, intense suffering, intense emotion of any kind that's uncomfortable. And for therapists, If we have clients who are in extreme distress, we want it to go away. We don't want them to be experiencing intense pain or suffering, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) There's like such a 
momentum towards like, let's just stop this. Let's make it go away. Yeah. Um, and what I appreciate about DBT is that dialectical approach of accepting what is and also looking for ways to change rather than one or the other. Right. And our distress tolerance skills in DBT have like such a broad range from simply accepting what's happening and that's all we're focusing on to doing things that do change our distress level pretty quickly. Right, that actually bring down our emotional arousal. Absolutely. And I can totally relate to what you just said in terms of as a therapist, I think this is part of why we do what we do. We don't want people to be in intense emotional pain. And I also think as a culture at large, there can be such a push towards let's fix this. Right. And there's a time and a place for that. If things can be fixed, sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. And there's also a time and a place for just being with. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about what it looks like when we respond to emotional pain in unskillful ways. So this might involve doing things rashly, and as you said a moment ago, doing things that provide immediate relief, but then work against us in the long term, and that work against us in the long term. Right. So an example might be if I am feeling really angry at someone. I think if I just yell, I'll feel better. And so that can get out all the intensity of that anger in the moment, but then I may regret how I handled the situation with another person. Right. And that may create additional problems for you down the road because now you have something in that relationship perhaps to repair. It might also create problems in how you are holding yourself or viewing yourself in terms of your self-respect being compromised. And so... I mean, we can probably come up with a whole bunch of examples of those sort of impulsive behaviors that we do that create more problems for us. And I think of a, like a classic one that comes to mind is, you know, someone quitting their job in a huff. You know, I quit because in the moment it feels good because you're angry and you're frustrated and it's a moment of power and relief when your distress is really high. And then the next day or the next week, you might be like, oh, oh, wow, what did I just do? Right. I think that any sort of addictive or compulsive behaviors would fall into this category as well. You know, like just wanting to numb out that pain. So using alcohol or drugs or food or sex or whatever to just numb out. Sometimes for some people, like thinking about suicide or imagining, like kind of checking out into their imagination. Those are other ways of just checking out, numbing out that don't necessarily solve the problem, but that take us out of it quickly that we may regret later. Yes. And these are the kind of behaviors that we will hear people talk about when they come to see us. Like, this is the problem. I'm thinking about wanting to end my life. I'm self-harming in some way. I'm rash. I've made a mess of my interpersonal relationships or I have some sort of compulsive behavior. You know, this is the problem. Let me fix this. And yes, of course, there's truth to that, and we want to help people change those behavioral patterns. And one of the key ways to do that is to learn to be with distress more skillfully. Right. So to be able to have a range of options for either bringing the distress down or tolerating it. Instead of what we, all of us as human beings, we kind of figure out what works and we keep using it until it's a habit. And at that is you know working short term but not long term it can be really hard to change those habits so in dbt we have this range of options for what to do when we're feeling really overwhelmed that so that it's not just the one option that we've been practicing to the point of habituation yes and often when people have been practicing the one option or a very small set of options to help ease emotional suffering it's because they don't know any other ways to do to help themselves. And I think that this is such an, an important piece because so often people feel a lot of shame with the techniques or the behaviors that they find themselves falling into over and over again. And I feel like the distress tolerance module helps alleviate some of that shame and says, actually, you just need more tools at your disposal. I think almost all of us have things that we do to relieve our pain quickly 
that we wish we didn't do, that we want to change. And what I appreciate about the distress tolerance skills in DBT is it just gives concrete options in addition to whatever we're doing. What I appreciate about the skills group is being able to hear other people talking about, yeah, I do this and it's not really working and how do I practice this new way so that that does reduce that shame of like, like what is wrong with me when it's such a human response? It is. We are all motivated to alleviate our emotional pain, our emotional suffering when we can. Right. And if we don't learn effective skills growing up, we're going to just turn to what, what works in the moment. And maybe that's some of the behaviors we talked about earlier. Right. I also think about distress tolerance skills as a natural outgrowth of mindfulness skills, which we talked about several episodes ago, because in mindfulness, we're just learning how to be with what is without insisting that it change. And that's a huge part of what we're talking about in distress tolerance. And I also think that that is a key component of well-being and mental health overall. Can you just be with your experience? Can you just be with your emotional state without attempting to change it? And I think that, you know, sometimes when I work with people early on, they want to, when they're ex experiencing extreme distress, like really powerful anger or sadness or anxiety, and they've learned a little bit about mindfulness, they want to practice mindfulness skills during those moments. And sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes the stress level is too high to actually concentrate and focus to be in the present moment, which is why some of the distress tolerance skills can really help us to figure out what our options are so that it's not just sit and be with intense pain <laughs> mindfully, which can be excruciating and too much to actually really do, versus just totally check out, explode, implode, you know, numb out, whatever it might be. And we have a lot of possibilities in between. Right. There's a whole range from mindfulness of current thought, which is one of our distress tolerance skills, to actually distraction is one of the distress tolerance skills that there is a skillful way to use distraction to help you when you're so emotionally overwhelmed that you can't be mindful in the moment or you can't think about anything else to do. So we're going to dive into all of those. I think this might be a good place to revisit the concepts of emotion mind versus reasonable mind and wise mind. Because these skills are great when emotion mind is super high. So in our skills group, we talk about subjective units of distress and we kind of lay out these different levels with, you know, one at your calmest and sort of 10 at your most distress. And so I think anything a seven or above, it might be really hard to access our wise mind when we get that upset. Yeah, I think that, you know, this, I, I really appreciate the idea of like, we have our emotion mind uh, that is guided by the emotions that come up, which are natural. We have our reasonable mind, which is capable of sorting through facts and pros and cons and that kind of thing. And our wise mind combines them. And when emotions are too high, as human beings, we're not meant to think we're meant to act. So when emotional distress is really, really high, we're not able to access that more reasonable part of our mind to get to that balanced state. And the distress tolerance skills help us bring that emotion down so that then we can access our wise mind and like, okay, what would be the best way forward here? Absolutely. And I think of the trauma response with the fight, flight, or freeze. So when we are under such high threat, there's a really adaptive purpose to us not being able to kind of logically lay things out and think about, you know, weigh pros and cons. We just need to act. Right. And this can apply to anxiety or fear, obviously, like that trauma response. It can easily, we can see it with anger. But we can also see it th with things like guilt or shame or even sadness, like intense, intense, overwhelming sadness can shut down our ability to think on the more reasonable side of our mind. Yes, absolutely. Let's just recap where we've been so far. The whole purpose of distress tolerance skills are to help you learn how to survive a crisis without making things worse. It's a pause. And as I said earlier, if you feel better, great, but that's not the purpose of these skills. They're just to help you get through. The other thing we talked about is these skills help you learn how to re accept reality as it is. 
because this is the only way out of hell, and ultimately to become free, which means that our intense emotions are more like the weather passing and we learn to ride out the storm rather than get carried away or swept up in the winds. So that's kind of the whole purpose of these skills. And I think for me, what I have found for myself practicing distress tolerance skills is I'm less afraid of being overwhelmed by emotion because now I know I've got plenty of options. When stress gets really high, emotion gets really high, so much more quickly I'm able to be like, okay, what are my options here? Where in the past, like feeling emotionally overwhelmed felt really scary. And there's often the sense of like, oh my gosh, will this ever go away? Maybe I just need to make this go away immediately. And so we're, we have so much more flexibility when we know there are options for managing intense emotion. I love that you just said that because it makes me think about some of the ripple effects of these skills and how people can leave DBT therapy with, I mean, so many things being changed, but such a stronger sense of their own efficacy in facing hard things. Absolutely. Yeah. So it really increases self-confidence like, oh, like life will throw me what it throws me and I know how to respond. Right. I hear this a lot from clients that I work with as they're going through DBT of like, oh my God, I knew how to handle that. Mm -hmm. Came up and I knew how to handle it. And it's like that great moment of like, ah, I just needed some concrete things to do. And now I have them and now I know when to apply them. And that's the process of this growth. Yeah, I feel so good. I mean, to experience it and then to witness people go through that. Mm -hmm. So while we're going to be discussing all these different distress tolerance skills over the next several episodes, we will be referring often to crises. So let's define what a crisis means in this framework. So. Basically, you are in a crisis when you're in a situation that is highly stressful, that is short term. So this is something that isn't going to last forever. And it really creates intense pressure to resolve the situation now so that there's something really stressful that isn't actually going to last forever, but we feel this pressure to make it go away quickly. Right. And that pressure to make it go away quickly relates to some of the things we talked about earlier, some of those behaviors, those storming out, those self-harming behavior, imploding or exploding, as you so nicely put it. So there's, it's a short-term situation where there's a lot of pressure to like fix it now. So, you know, when we're in that kind of situation, we want to be able to use crisis survival skills so that when we have pain that cannot be fixed quickly, like the pain may be really intense, but it's not going to go away immediately. Acting on our emotions may make things worse. We are not going to be able to stay in our wise mind and stay skillful. Those are examples of where we want to use crisis survival skills. Absolutely. I want to add to that. So we're talking here about, you know, short-term intensely emotional situations where there's a really strong desire to fix it now or feel better in the moment. A crisis can also be when you are facing a major demand that will have serious consequences if you don't meet that demand. So let me explain that a little bit. This means that you have a deadline, for example, and you are feeling really sad and like you can't get out of bed, you can't make it to your computer to work on that deadline. And so during those moments, you can also use crisis survival skills because in DBT, we would also define that as a crisis situation where if you don't actually do the things you need to do, you are going to have a lot of problems down the road. So this, as I said, could be something related to work or school, an important meeting or deadline. So when you have those strong desires because of emotional overwhelm or emotional distress to procrastinate or avoid, those are also times that we would consider a crisis and you need to pull out some of these big guns to help bring down your emotional distress enough so you can do what you need to do. Let's talk just briefly about when not to use these skills because they're fabulous and there can be the danger sometimes of overusing them. So we don't use these skills for everyday life problems. We have a whole bunch of other skills we teach in DBT that can help with that. 
And the reason why we don't use these skills for solving everyday problems is they're not designed for that. They're not problem solvers. They're more ride out the storm kind of skills. I think when we talk about the way we use all of the DBT skills in our skills group, the emotion regulation skills, skills for actually changing our emotional responses, and the interpersonal effectiveness skills for really interacting with other people in a way that really works for us, those require a certain amount of wise mind, being able to access the reasonable side of our mind. So often we'll talk about using distress tolerance skills to then be in a position to access other skills for emotion regulation or interpersonal effectiveness. But if we are so overwhelmed by emotion, we got to bring those down. We're not using, for instance, distraction, which can be so valuable short term as a strategy for getting through every single day. Right. Or for creating the life that you want. And in the distress tolerance skill set, so we teach a skill distraction and we also teach a set of skills called self-soothing. And so some of the things you can do when you're practicing self-soothing or, you know, take a bath or get yourself, you know, your special drink that you love to enjoy, you know, engaging your senses in one way or another. And so if you are using self-soothing to work on your long-term life goals, it's not going to go well. Right. Again, these skills are meant to help us get through a short-term crisis. They're not going to move us forward. A whole other set of skills will move us forward in the direction of our goals. This is to bring down the distress enough to actually do those other skills. Yeah, this is the, the life jacket. These are not necessarily teaching you how to swim. So let's delve into one of these skills. Should we talk about the stop skill? Yeah, this is a, such a good one. I know it's simple and short and sweet, but it can be incredibly effective. Yeah, so the stop skill is where we start <laughs> when it comes to distress tolerance. Am I the first one that ever said that? Probably not. <laughs> Any DBT people out there are kind of like, yeah, I know they say that every time, but the... Um, I have never heard it before, so I like it. <laughs> I have not either, so I feel, you know... <laughs> original. Really original. So the stop skill is a very basic skill when we notice that things are starting to become overwhelming. And as with so many things in DBT, the STOP skill is an acronym, which stands for STOP, take a step back, observe, and proceed mindfully. So that's the STOP of the STOP skill. And I know it's hard when we're talking about acronyms on a podcast, so people are listening. So when we're teaching this in group, we're writing it on the board and people have a sheet of paper in front of them. So just to recap... So the acronym is S-T-O-P, the S is for stop, the T is for take a step back, the O is for observe, the P is for proceed mindfully, and we'll go into each of those in a bit more depth. And we're also going to link to the skills book in our the show notes so people can follow along if they'd like to. So when we're practicing the stop skill, it can sometimes be helpful to actually visualize a stop sign because we've all seen millions of them throughout our lives in our mind. So yeah, I think that, and for me, like I will sometimes even like do a stop motion with my hand for myself of like, okay, stop. As if you're trying to, you know, signal to someone to stop. And really it's like, take that moment not to just react, not to just go with whatever's going on, but just to stop in our tracks, take a pause. Right. So this is, you know, don't do anything. And when I first started teaching DBT, I was like, this is... I don't think I respected the skill enough. It sounds really simple and it's so powerful if we can just actually freeze for a moment and not react. There is so much more choice when we can take that pause. So that's the S in stop. And it's really about control, staying in control. And when we are very emotional, so many of us feel pretty out of control. Right. And I know from myself, I've experienced this and I hear it from clients all the time of like the power of noticing, and this comes into the, our mindfulness skills, noticing like I am really revved up right now. I am starting to get going and to just stop and pause and notice. And that's where the T in the stop skill is for take a step back. So we stop in our tracks 
we pause the line of thinking or the actions or the instincts that we're going on. And then we take a step back from that. And sometimes people will talk about literally taking a step back. <laughs> yeah, right. If you're having about to maybe have an argument with someone, literally taking a step back gives you a little bit more physical distance and can send a message to yourself, I'm retreating, I'm pausing for a moment. Right. So, you know, taking that step back, literally or figuratively, taking a deep breath, something to like kind of reinforce the pause with the stop. So the stop says stop, the T says take a step back, pause it, take a deep breath, and then observe. So again, like I kind of have like a visual of, you know, rushing forward and just stopping and literally taking a step back to instead of going with that momentum that the emotion is creating, we're starting to reverse a little bit. We're stepping back from the edge of where that emotion might be taking us. It makes me think, I'm imagining a lot of listeners can relate to this when you have your phone in front of you and you're about to send that angry text, <laughs> right? And then so the T would be like, delete, 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 delete. <laughs> yeah. Let's erase that. <laughs> I think we've, we've probably all, all been we've all already practiced this skill many times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so once we've stopped, we've paused, we've, you know, kind of taken a breath, then we observe what's happening. Notice what's going on within us to pay attention to what emotions am I feeling? What thoughts am I having? What body sensations am I experiencing? Just notice what's happening with me. Notice what's going on in the situation. Like what's happening here? What's the other person doing or thinking? Where am I right now? You know, like to, that we just kind of take inventory of what's happening that's causing such a strong emotional response. Yes. And I, I love the O oh, and the skill, the observe, because it helps move us from that tunnel vision or that zoom lens we get when we're upset and something feels really challenging. And it gives us a wide angle lens. It really opens up our view when we can observe. We're observing what is happening around us and also what's happening internally. Is my breath shallow? Are my hands clenched? What am I thinking? Am I thinking this person's an idiot or I'm an idiot or I need to tell them off? Right. And again, just noticing our physical response. For instance, noticing, oh my gosh, my hands are clenched. Like I'm, my shoulders are so tight, I'm holding my breath. Like just right there gives us information of what we might do. Like start with taking a breath, <laughs> valuable. But also I think like noticing our thoughts because so often when our emotions are really revved up, there's a series of thoughts that are just going, going, going. And just notice, what am I thinking right now? What is the story I'm telling myself? Exactly. Using like the observe is so similar to our mindfulness skills, like non-judgmentally noticing what am I thinking? Instead of just going with like, yeah, they are an idiot, you know, like, or no, I'm never going to get over this, right? Like, I am noticing that I am thinking this person is an idiot, right? So different than just believing it. Such a different quality. So that's where that observing of just notice what's happening. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right. It, it akin to the observe that we talk about as one of the foundations of mindfulness. And if we can't observe what's happening outside of us and inside of us, it's so hard to be mindful and to make skillful decisions. So that's the O in our stop. And then let's move on to the final portion of the stop skill, which is the P, which stands for proceed mindfully. Right. I have such a strong visual of this skill, which is like imagining myself just rushing forward, right? And I stop, I take a step back. So I'm moving in the opposite direction that I had been rushing. I observe what's going on. And then I start to walk again, but slower, more deliberate, putting one foot in front of the other. I'm proceeding mindfully based on the information that I gained by observing. And when we're proceeding mindfully, it gives us a moment to think about what our 
ultimate goals are. What do we want in this situation? Is it to tell the other person off? Is it to numb out? Or is it something else? It doesn't mean you have to work towards that goal in the moment, but you can get clear. Often we can get clear like, oh, I really don't want to yell at this old friend of 20 years. That's not what I ultimately want. So like using the example of the, you know, firing off an angry text, notice ourselves typing up our rant, which I think that's how I would describe myself, like to just delete it, right? And then proceed mindfully might be, don't respond, take a minute, step away from the phone, right? It might be to say, can we talk about this later? Mm -hmm. It might be to say, I'm feeling really angry or whatever it might be, right? The proceed mindfully can take a lot of different forms, but it is not just going with the flow of that emotion that might have gotten us started, but it's figuring out what's the wise thing to do here. What's moving me in the direction that I actually want to go. Yes. And then taking the action that does move us in that direction. Right. Absolutely. So really nice description of how to engage the P and the stop skill, which is proceed mindfully. And we're pulling on as we did with the O with for observe and here with the P for proceed mindfully, we're really pulling on our mindfulness skills. And this is why we tell people when they want to start learning DBT that you have to learn all the different modules. You can't sort of just dip in for distress tolerance because they work in conjunction and you need a strong foundation, particularly of mindfulness to help you understand and really engage the other skills. Right. And again, the point of mindfulness is able to be in the present moment, not distracted. And so with this stop skill, we're noticing that my emotions are really high and I want to slow it down, be in the present moment, think about what's important and act on what's important rather than act on whatever instinct is being driven by these emotions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ed, for joining me again to talk about the skill. And we will delve into a whole bunch more distress tolerance skills in subsequent episodes. Great. Thanks for listening to today's episode. To learn more, or if you're in the Bay Area and want to get started with therapy, you can find us online at bayareadbtcc.com. That's bayareadbtcc.com.